Okay. Let's get this going. <laughs> come on. Oh, come on. Audio levels. There we go. I think that's where we want to be. You'll let me know, hopefully. If it's not. <sighs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name's Michael Markowski, and today we're going to recreate another painting by another one of my very favorite artists. Today's artist could very well be one of my maybe top three, five artists of all time. We are going to be looking at the art of Stuart Davis today. Stuart Davis is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the greatest painters of all time. Certainly one of the most unique artists of all time, and an artist who was fiercely independent and uh, kind of carved his own little niche out of, uh, out of the history of art. And so we're going to get right into it here. This is the painting that we are going to recreate. It's called, Oh, in Sao Paulo. <laughs> <laughs> which I, uh, he's kind of famous for his his uh, titles for his paintings, and I think this is just another one of his playful uh, ways that he's titled a painting. So this is the painting we're gonna do. I want to let you know that there's an, a free outline. My computer is being slur. There we go. So this is the outline for today's painting, and I'm gonna show you how to do that in just a moment here. So uh, I wanna show you where you can download this free outline, and then you can trace it onto a canvas, and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Just as a little bit of a heads up for, um, you'll see at the very top, of, so there's a, a link to a Dropbox folder in the description below, and you click on that Dropbox folder, you're gonna see tons and tons of folders in here over a hundred folders for all the hundred and sixty six paintings that we've done so far as well as as some new folders at the very top now these currently are empty probably by the time you're, you're watching this if you're watching it after it went live there'll be things in here but this is because starting in january i'm restarting the intro to painting episodes uh, under the master study um series and there's going to be some templates and things that are going to go inside some of these folders. And I'm also going to kind of try to make some very simple paintings for people. And those will be categorized right up at the very, very top here. So anyway, that's just a little bit of something coming down the pipeline for, for everyone. We scroll all the way down here. All these awesome paintings we've done here. We're at number 99. As I said, many of these folders have two, three, five, eight paintings inside of each one. That's how we get up to that wild number of 166 here. You click on num number 99, you see Stuart Davis. There's three files in here. You, of course, have two versions of the outline. One's a PDF, one's a JPEG, whichever is easier to print, and then the original image itself as well. So let's... Um, Go to, just while I have uh, the browser open, just to kind of quick check in with people here, is that there's a free private Facebook group just for people like yourself who are watching and where you can upload a photograph of the painting you made today to the group and get feedback from other artists like yourself. And then once a month, I go through all of those images and give some feedback to, to people to help them improve their painting process, work through common issues and problems people might be experiencing. Whether or not it's a painting like today's painting by Stuart Davis, it's a painting like the Van Gogh paintings that we did, or the Emily Carr, or Frida Kahlo, or Berta Morisot, or all of the other hundreds of artists that we've already talked about, or it's something completely of your own inspiration that you've seen something and you've you're you're inspired and you got you want to make a painting of it you can upload it here and once a month we'll take a look at so here's some of these uh paintings leslie's been working on awesome paula this is so here's one that she's just done on her own 
And I thought this was really funny, Gail. This cracked me up when I saw this. I don't always paint... I don't always have paint on my clothes, but... Oh, yes, wait, I do. Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, so we'll, t we'll talk about Stuart Davis's biography in a moment. I want to get the painting started, however, so that while the paint is drying a little bit, we can look at the biography of this incredible artist. So I'm going to play a short video just showing how the the drawing was done here so you see that i i've printed out downloaded that file from the dropbox and just printed it on regular on my inkjet printer here at home on photocopy paper and then i'm going to transfer it onto a 9 by 12 sized canvas 9 by 12 is sort of like a very very standard size of canvas board and you can get this exact one that i'm using there again there's a link to an amazon um uh, there's an Amazon link in the description below which you can use to purchase it and then I'm just using some carbon paper and I'm put that in between and then I'm going to trace over I think every line in this case I had some questions I'm just going to zip through here but I this for the most part of this tracing I was like ah, I don't know about those little dots and then after and I even did the signature here because that's even he incorporates his signature as part of the composition and then I was like, you know what, maybe I should do these little dots. So I also did the little dots on here as well. So this, this took, you know, about maybe 10 minutes to outline because there's a lot of little details here. And it's a good idea just before you, you tear that tape off just to make sure you got all the most important lines. Okay. So once you've done that, you will have a canvas with an image on it and you also have your outline and this is since this is a double-sided carbon paper you have a reversed image too if you like now i save these so that i potentially could make more copies if i wanted to um or you could use them as to test colors and mixes on there now the first thing that i typically do is i use some warm yellow that I'm going to apply all over this canvas, and uh, today is is um, I, I was going to yeah. I'm just taking a quick little look at this image. That's a bit of a cooler yellow, but I'm still going to apply the warm yellow. I think. Yeah, because we're going to be... Yeah, okay. So, I need to get my water. I forgot to get my water. One sec. Okay. So, what I do is I just take some regular water from my sink here. There's been times where I'm like, oh, maybe a little bit hotter, maybe... I think just room temperature, maybe not freezing cold and not boiling water. You know, you just turn your tap on and take whatever comes out of it. Um, that's, I put maybe a little bit more water in there than I typically do, which is just means it's going to be a little bit more transparent if I mix it up well enough, which is, you know, really the point of doing this for me is just covering the white and obliterating the white because... That's usually the thing that most people find the most intimidating is staring at a white canvas. And yes, we do have an image drawn on there already, but even then, this also helps um, protect those pencil lines from getting smudged later on. And uh, it also kind of keeps, if there's little gaps between the color, I'd much rather, like in between the shapes and lines and everything else we paint on a canvas, I'd much rather there be another color there in between the shapes than white, because that white just always makes the painting look a little bit unfinished. Um, so, and that's just... Uh, I guess it's in, in many ways it's just a holdover from my time as an art student because preparing a canvas with some kind of colored layer like this is 
you know what you learn in art school like day one uh, because every artist since the Renaissance has pretty much done this there are examples of certain like um, art movements that did not do this um, over the centuries but I would say 90% of all artists prior to maybe the 1980s put some kind of color on generally it, it was more of a rusty red uh, kind of a brownish warm brown reddish brown um, that people would apply there um, but for convenience sake I've been painting this yellow and I really like it so I'm now using it in my own artwork I'm, I'm walking the talk yeah <laughs> sit there and think for a second did that did I get the metaphor right there missing a red okay so I'm gonna put just some paint on the palette here and then we'll jump into talking and showing a little bit of the artist's life uh, John says I just purchased a scalpel the other day um, I see some people are talking about using tape in the chat uh, you could use tape for today's painting I'm not gonna use tape I'm just gonna paint today uh, because I I don't I mean I think he there might have been times where he used tape in his paintings but I think mostly he was just very careful about his application of paint um, so that is interesting that um, so John talks about the reminds me of the cutouts of Matisse you could do this as a collage I suppose if you wanted yeah I mean it is a good it, it um, Matisse's collages though aren't really what until the 1930s and 40s if I have that correct so in many ways like you know uh, Stuart Davis and making the types of art that he made with these very geometric hard lines precedes Matisse okay, got to open a new tube of paint here uh, if you want to know the exact tubes of paint that I'm using there's I mentioned them in the description below but you don't need to use this brand of paint I'm not sponsored by anyone. They have reached out and, and talked to me about doing something, which may happen at some point, but um, I don't want to, to appear that I'm promoting anything because I really do think you can make any painting with any brand of paint, even the cheapest dollar store paint. Maybe it's not going to turn out as well as you might want it to, but you could still do it. Um, and you know I've seen videos on the internet people talking you know trying to make a painting with um, anyway maybe that's something I'll do one day um, John says my double tape is stick in a night and I find it hard to pull them off any my double not my double tape is stick in a night and I find it hard to pull them off any recommendations Michael I'm assuming what you're talking about there is you're you're using tape to paint and then you're finding it hard to take the tape off maybe it's tearing the, t the paint um, usually what I would say is if you're using paint with acrylic paint to if you're using tape and then painting acrylics over you don't want to let it dry too long because once it really dries and the bond is fully hardened then you're really you have to use I see you're talking about a scalpel or a knife to cut the paint uh, so if you're using tape you, you can see me I use a hair dryer and I dry but it's not fully cured that way you can kind of peel it up and it, and it still tears well enough if you leave it overnight you might need to actually cut along the tape which is a bit of a pain for sure and sometimes if you don't get it right on the tape then you might get a little bit of tape there or you you miss a gap so 
you kind of have to work kind of quickly when you're using tape. Um, okay, so let's just put this back here and then let's talk about Stuart Davis's uh, career and look at some of his other artwork here. So Stuart Davis is uh, born in Philadelphia, 1892, and dies in New York City in 1964. And I think what's interesting is it's not really until the very, very end of his life where he sees the beginning of his legacy, uh, the, the, what he began actually being embraced by another generation. Because for the majority of his life, he's sort of off in his own land doing his own thing. So, which I have a great deal of respect for because in many ways that's sort of like how my own career as an artist has, has been of as sort of doing my own thing and not really having other people uh, to... Um, to, to compare notes with, I guess. You know, in my own personal art practice, not this kind of stuff that we're doing here, but uh, if you go to my website, the link below, you'll see me doing things like flying around in planes and going to the North Pole, all that kind of stuff. That's a whole other conversation. So uh, let me see. Let's talk about just about quickly about his biography. You know, so he's... Um, he's his father was the art editor of the Philadelphia Press, like a major newspaper in Philadelphia. And I think that is kind of interesting. We, not always, but often artists who become well-known have some connection to art in their family history, whether it's a father or mother. There, there's many examples of famous artists whose fathers were art teachers or successful or budding artists in and of themselves and this I think is no different right his father uh, obviously uh, spent a lot of time kind of with other artists and designers working on the newspaper and then his mother was a sculptor as well right so I mean he grew up in a very creative artistic family I'm sure they spent a lot of time going to museums and things as a child and I think at age, or starting in 1909, right there. So uh, I haven't read <laughs> the Wikipedia entry here just from all the research I've been doing over the past couple weeks. Um, but I think at like age 13, he starts taking classes from Robert Henry. And Robert Henry, we've talked about a number of times. He's this sort of artist that keeps coming up in American art uh, around the turn of the 20th century because a lot of artists were either students of his or friends of Robert Henry. Uh, so he's a very, very influential artist. And one day I'd like to, to do an episode f featuring this artist. Uh, Robert Henry, Henry is most associated with the Ashcan School. And so we've talked about the Ashcan School when we did the... Um, the Tanner painting most recently, the, the Thankful Poor for th American Thanksgiving. Uh, but the Ashcan School was really maybe the first major art movement in uh, American history, arguably, right? I mean, there's the Hudson River School, which we talked about, which preceded that. But I think, well, I guess that was pretty big. So maybe the second major art movement in American history. But the Ashcan School was very, very influential. And an artist we're going to be talking about on Boxing Day here in Canada is a painting by another one of my very, very favorite artists. And we, we will, we'll see that when we get there. Um, but what I think is really interesting, in 1913, Davis exhibits as part of the Armory Show. And the Armory Show is really, arguably, one of the most important art exhibitions in modern art history, if not the most important. Um... At least, definitely in, in North American art history, absolutely, undisputably the most important single art exhibition. Because that show was this was in this big sort of warehouse down by the, the, uh, the, the, the what's now the cruise ship terminal area, but like the warehouse district in New York City. 
and there was sort of two giant halls. One hall was dedicated to contemporary American art, and another giant hall was full of the latest art from Europe. And so you have the really often, for in many ways, this is the first time Picasso and Matisse and Marcel Duchamp, um, you know, all of the great European artists that we now know of, this is really the first time they were ever exhibited in the United States. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands and thousands of people came in and saw especially young American artists like Stuart Davis, right? So here we have, this is the cubist room. And so they had a whole bunch of little different rooms featuring different art. But this is the first time Americans have ever seen cubism, which has been going on for a couple of years in Europe. You know, this is maybe the closest example you could think of to when the Beatles first came to uh, the United States. You know, when they play Ed Sullivan, and then they go on and they start playing all of these big, you know, um, baseball stadiums across the United States and Canada. And it's just like this, it's a shock, right? The same sort of like the British invasion with music. Here we have sort of the European invasion of art 50 years before that moment. And it is, it's, it's, it's like an explosion because it, Americans, you know, it's not like today where you, you, you pull up in information on your phone and you can read about what's going on on the other side of the planet in real time. News would travel slowly and especially art news, right? Art news, it's not like the sinking of the Titanic and it's on the front cover of the, every newspaper and everyone's talking about it on the, on the way to work. Art news if it's reported at all, like things haven't really changed, uh, is, you know, maybe, you know, page 70 at the back of the newspaper, one little column, probably not even any photographs at all. So really the most, the way that most artists would find out about what's going, oh, I'm not even showing the images on the screen here. What am I talking about? Okay, so here's, uh, <laughs> good thing I haven't shown any paintings. So here's uh, the, the cubist room in, in the um, at the armory show, and so the so sorry the the way that most artists would actually find out about what's going on in in other places around the world in terms of art was through friends who would travel and come back, and they might have a you know a, a exhibition catalog, but even then, most of the time, those exhibition catalogs would just have maybe a list of the paintings that were on display there. So, you know, it wasn't really until the art was on display in a town close to you that you would be able to see what's going on. So when artists, American artists, mostly New York based artists came in and saw this, they're like, whoa, we heard, you know, I had a, a you know, my, my teachers, wife's brother I, I you know i heard a story trickle down they had seen some kind of a cubist painting in paris like when they went like what is that all about right so it's just sort of mind-blowing to think of because stuart davis was re he exhibited as part of the armory show which is a, a really cool little historical fact but he spends a lot of time going back to that exhibition, especially looking at the cubist paintings. And his mind is just completely overwhelmed, right? So he had taken classes with Robert Henry since like the age of 13. He's, I think, at 19 or 20 when he's exhibiting in the show, which is very rare, especially back then. Most of the time, artists didn't really start exhibiting their art professionally until maybe in their 30s. More commonly, a lot of artists didn't survive off their art until they retired, right? They would be a doctor, or dentist, a scientist or whatever, and maybe dabbling in art, you know, at night. Um, even some of the most successful artists like Matisse, like uh, it's not until a little bit older where they have a little bit of financial security and spend more and more time dedicated to the art. So for an artist like Stuart Davis to be exhibiting his art in the biggest art exhibition that anyone had ever seen up until that time, was a you know a, says a lot about his success as a as a painter to begin with. So um, uh, yeah, so he's 
I'm just reading here off here. So he's blown away by the art that he sees there. He, he especially is, again, really interested in the Cubist artwork. And a lot of people talk about Stuart Davis as being a Cubist painter. And he did really jump into the to the Cubist movement here. Let's just take a look at his art. Um, the, the, the 20 images that they have here on wiki art give us a little indication of, you see he kind of flirts with this cubist kind of style. He's also kind of flirting a little bit with more a Matisse type of, of imagery here. And then we'll come back to this painting in a moment because this is basically the painting that he ends up making again for that we're going to make today. This is another famous early painting of his. I think this is in the Museum of Modern Art. And then you can see in the mid-1920s, late 1920s, all of the sudden this very, very colorful work starts to appear and that is unlike anything anyone else was doing at the time for the next 50 years. I mean, there's select few examples of artists who had such brightly colored artwork. Maybe the only other one that I can think of at the top of my head is Fernand Leger who uh, Stuart Davis would have seen if this ever loads up here. Uh, so here's Leger's artwork here. And so we see quite colorful work. We see similar kinds of line work and everything in here, but certainly not like exactly the kind of stuff that we see here with Stuart Davis. I'm actually surprised there's only 20 of his works here with the wiki art. And, you know, he dies in 1964, so this would have been one of his final paintings, Blips and Ifs. You know, I love these <laughs> these titles. Wrapped at Rappaports. Something on the 8-Ball. G&W. The Mellow Pad. Report from Rockport. Sane Cart. Hot Stillscape for Six Colors. Seventh a Avenue Style. Egg beater number four. <laughs> Steep, steeple and street. You know, like, I just, I love, I, I'm a, I, I have a soft spot for, um, uh, what is it? Is it alliteration? So it's kind of fun play on words. Anyway, someone will be sure to, to remind me here. Uh, I see there's a bunch of, ch of mentions here in the chat. Today is December 7th, the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. It also happens to be the... Uh, it's Stuart Davis's birthday. So I, uh, 1892 to today is... I don't know, you do the math, like 130 or, birthday or so. Uh, anything else? We're going to talk about his relationship to jazz music here in a moment. Um... Anything else that needs to be said that hasn't been said? Um, oh yeah, so here's a mention of Leger. Yeah. I like this, this little quote here. I don't want people to copy Matisse or Picasso, although it was entirely proper to admit their influence. I don't make paintings like theirs, I make paintings like mine. Like that, that's cool. Okay, so let's get right into today's painting. That's enough of my chatter, and let's get to the action. So, um, the canvas is warping a little bit. Might be just because things are getting colder and colder in the studio. So, uh, we'll see, it probably will lay a little bit more flat once we get more paint on here. So, as I look at the original, I'm just thinking about colors. Let's put them side by side. I actually, you know, we could do a little bit more cold yellow over top of this background. And maybe I will do that. I think it'll, it will cause very little change. And because, I don't know the way it looks on camera, this looks a little bit cooler yellow than it actually is. There's a bit more 
orangey quality to the a warm yellow, whereas on, on at least on the camera that I see up in front of me here, it's a little bit warmer. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just I got my brush here. I'm just going to clean that off because it's been sitting there unused for a few moments. So I'm just going to take this cool yellow and you know what? Let's just paint right over the whole thing. And you're probably like, well, why didn't we just paint cool yellow to begin with? Um, you could, but I think a cool yellow might be just too cool. <laughs> um, cool yellow has, has a bit more of a lime quality. It, both of the yellows are quite transparent. So this cool yellow going over top of our warm yellow, the warm yellow is still coming through, it's just being modified by this cool yellow in a way that is is gonna, I think, get us a really nice saturated, bright kind of effect. Oh, you know what? It wasn't totally dry. Ah, I should have blow dried it. So what's happened up here anyway is I've I don't think that's I'm not sure if that's going to come through on camera or not. But oops. Um, what I see here is some streaks because I basically by applying the cool yellow over top of this warm yellow, it wasn't totally dry. I've got these marks. Anyway, that's something I can fix later on if I deem it needing to be fixed. Okay. He says, uh, World War II is a big influence on Davis's generation of American artists. I uh, maybe, you know, at this time in you know, he dies nineteen, no, yeah, about fifth, yeah, nineteen years after Pearl Harbor. Uh, so, so around like 15, 18 years after. I, Stuart Davis would have was an older man by the time uh, Pearl Harbor happened. I would say uh, World War II, you know, had an effect, but what influence it had, I don't. I think he was, you know, he's definitely by towards the end of his career when World War II breaks out. Um, you probably would what. I'm sure World World War One would have been, you know, would have had much greater impact on him. And I'm actually surprised that he didn't serve in World War One, wasn't conscripted into the army. Uh, I'm, so I'm not sure what the story is with that at all. So, um, okay. So I am gonna finally blow dry this now. <sighs> So I'm just going to mute the microphone for a moment.
Okay. So there's a few other little things here. If I wanted to fix this, I think what I will, I'll probably eventually clean this up by putting some white down here, putting my warm yellow. In fact, um, you know what, instead of me trying to fix it now, it's quite likely that there's going to be a few little things that happen over the course of the, the rest of the painting. So I might as well just wait until then and then I can fix it all at once in a little bit here. Um, Lori says, I read online that Stuart Davis based this work on a coffee pot and, and it mentioned cylinders. I see the cylinders, but coffee pot, I know he abstracted things, but I don't see inspiration for coffee. So interesting that you mentioned that. So here's today's painting. This was made in 1951. This is a painting he made in 1927 called Percolator. And so here's the, the coffee percolator um, this whole contraption machine here, if you've ever been to one of those crazy coffee shops where they have all sorts of, it looks like a chemistry set. I think this is more along the lines of what he was originally basing this off of. So here, when we look at this painting from 1927, we can see a lot more of a cubist influence, right? This, this could be, it's not really something maybe that Picasso would have painted, but it definitely has, you know, much more of the color palette that we identify with cubism. These grays and browns, kind of muddy greens, uh, oranges, you know. So this is the original painting he created. And then 20 or so years later, this is the painting that he makes at his sort of the height of his powers, you know, again, but 10 years before he passes, 15 years before he passes away. The main kind of changes is the addition of text in here. Um, so, which I think is really interest like else and we used to be now, right? All of these things that sort of suggest the passing of time and change, uh, you know, sort of, and it, you know, and it makes sense when it's, he's sort of appropriating his own artwork here. I think that's kind of interesting, seeing these two side by side or, or one on top of the other. Okay, next step is uh, on this painting. As I said, you could you do all this with tape, but I think that would be really, really time consuming. So what I'm going to end up doing is painting with some, adding a little bit of white into some colors to get a, a base layer and then doing another more saturated color afterwards. So for instance, I'm going to do a bunch of red to start and I'm also going to use the same pink to do some pink you know, down here, but uh, I'm gonna kind of just paint in a bunch of these areas relatively quickly. Now, the reason I know that this is a ultimately going to be a darker red, but by adding this, it's a little bit of white into my color at this stage, it will allow me to paint um, just w basically two layers of red and I'll get a really nice bright super saturated color in that place later on so let's let's go right up here You can see I'm using a, I'm not using a tiny little brush. I always think like the moment you start breaking out those tiny little brushes, the painting slows down dramatically. Yeah, is everything's gonna be super accurate if I'm using a bigger brush? No, I'm gonna sacrifice a little bit of, of accuracy. But my goal with these, this whole series of paintings is not to make perfect paintings. It's, it's to learn a little bit about 
how to paint, how to mix colors. If you want to spend a long time reproducing any of these paintings, and you I mean that's your your right to do so. Uh, I think one thing that I often see though is beginner artists will often you know spend long periods of time on one artwork and if when it doesn't turn out get very discouraged and sometimes may not continue painting after kind of having a couple setbacks and that makes me very very sad and I think keeping the train running and and trying to work a little bit quicker and not being obsessed with perfection is is the key to maintaining a certain level of, of interest you know I was just reading I saw a comment from someone today on my drawing course that I did who was saying thank you so much for emphasizing you know that the the that perfection is not important in fact it can be a hindrance that so found that very liberating I see that comment from people all the time you know me saying that perfection is not important it's not that's not something that I some genius comment that I came up with that, you pro, you almost hear that from every every artist at least any artist that I respect says things like that all the time um, and I remember when I was in art school I would hear that all the time from my teachers because I think most of us you know when we grow up in in the Western world anyway we're taught to kind of you know practice makes perfect and the, this idea that perfection is what we're always striving for and you can't get ahead if you if you're lazy and sloppy and um, and yet you know when it comes to art I, you know we value personal expression more than perfection and I'm always telling students that like I'd much rather see you try to do something really ambitious and fail than do something that you're already very capable of doing and doing it really really well like it's great sure but then why are you even in art school <laughs> like if you're if you've if you've got it all perfected then just go out there into the world and do it right um, I think art uh, is for the art that I appreciate anyway gives me permission to to uh, be to 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 be free and to to play and to have fun um, so and and honestly I, I've, I say it here again and again and again and again but you know unfortunately the vast majority of people including your friends and family will very rarely spend any time looking closely at the art that you make you might want them to, to drop everything and just stand in admiration for hours and hours at the genius of which you've you've put out there into the world and then feel very disappointed when they don't <laughs> behave in a state of awe but the, the frank the, in reality it's just most people, I think also because a lot of people don't really know how to look at art. No one's really ever kind of instructed. They feel very intimidated. So they're just like, uh, okay, I think it's good. I, I guess it's on the wall of the museum. It must be good. So, okay, I've seen it. Uh, how much longer do we need to walk around here before we can go to the cafe and get a coffee? Because, whoo starting to get a headache looking at all this stuff and I don't understand any of it so I'm not really sure what looking at it for f another 30 seconds or five minutes is gonna do to improve my understanding of it right 
You know, I often, you know, what I find really interesting is, is I love going to museums and drawing in muse artworks in a museum. I bring my sketchbook and I just set up and I just start drawing. And sometimes it's not the most famous painting in a museum. And I'll often, people will come up to me or, and like they'll just stand and kind of watch and they're kind of looking at the painting, looking at my drawing. Right? <laughs> and there, there's some, sometimes they're like, I'll be sitting here like this and they are like right there. <laughs> sometimes I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's close enough, right? Um, but uh, often people are, I've had people stop and like, why are you drawing this painting? Because they're just like, it's not by a famous person. I've never heard of this artist. So why would you possibly, you know, be interested in painting it? Um, so, because I, th and sometimes there's, there's times where I remember once where I was in an art museum and just standing and looking at a painting for a long time and then a security guard came up and asked me, he's like, I've never seen someone stand in front of a painting that long and, and looked at it like that. Like, what, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what you're looking at? And, which I was very happy to do because, you know, I this fellow is standing there looking at surrounded by all this great art so I wanted to kind of I was happy to share with him sort of uh, you know what I I see when I'm looking at artworks and maybe that's a subject for a video that I can do at some point because really you know when I'm looking at art I'm often sort of looking at how it was made and trying to think about like the technique that was involved, like the, sometimes I, I often go right up to the painting. I'm looking at trying to see if I can see the colors that were underneath everything, which you can often see sometimes on the edges of the canvas, you know, like right where, um, often right around near the frame, if it's framed at all. And so I often like going right up and kind of looking at the sides and seeing if I can see some of that. Um, <laughs> I think I lost my train of thought. Why, why am I talking about this? I think what I was, I was because I was talking about using a big brush, I think. <laughs> um, I think that's where I began this whole thing way back when. So, you know, I can later on, if I really want nice sharp corners on some of these shapes which you know Stuart Davis did you know if I'm looking at this there is a really nice precision but you know that might be something that I do later on with a little bit of white and I can take that white and go in and clean up some of that and put that cool yellow back on top and it'll look really great but I'm always thinking especially at this stage like just get the paint on here don't worry about making perfect lines and all that kind of stuff. In fact, here with this number six, I'm just gonna paint that really quickly because I'm gonna paint black around it. So I can, as long as I can kind of see it a little bit, I might, I'm not sure if you can see it, but you kind of see it still there when I cup my hands around it. Um,
fact, I'm just going to take this and go right through. That way I can be ensured that these lines are going to match up on the other side of those shapes. So there's maybe a little bit of confusion that might happen because I'm painting everything, all of the pinks and reds, both in pink here. So the stuff that is, I've painted pink, I could just keep pink. Stuff that I want to be red, I'll just paint red over top later, like these triangle shapes. name maybe I'll do that I, yeah I'll do that later so I'm not ready to start getting all fussy just yet so let's do some of these dots the same sort of thing here with these little spots if I'm if I'm kind of a little bit sloppy or lazy I can clean all this up later I typically don't like starting to use a small brush this early into a painting but with this particular image kind of forced into it a bit So this, I'm going to just rotate the, um, so that it's just easier for me to paint. is interesting I always appreciate art more when I understand the background uh, the story behind it. it says more about me than the art uh, Lori says do you think he would have used tape I don't know I you know um, I suspect he didn't um, I haven't read anything talking about about him using tape so I don't think he did I think he just was just very careful when he's painting tape would have been like a pretty radical step like again you can see um, there's a little bit of sloppiness here and I'm not super concerned with that I find it much easier to clean up a little bit later on than it is to try to be perfect early on. 
to, to a certain extent, right? Sometimes just if you're making a gigantic mess, then you end up causing yourself a big headache later. But for the most part, I find like if I'm trying to be too perfect, or, oops. Okay. <laughs> so you know what, I may even just continue these circles right through the, the words, the letter shapes here. That makes most sense to me in order to be able to The words are going to be in black, right? So something funky happened there. Again, I'm just using his image, so I'm not. <sighs> See, I should have just done the whole thing. Okay, so, but anyway, I think that's going to be fine. This is such a small little part of the painting. Uh, but if I was to do it again, I, what I probably would do is just actually do, maybe not even draw the, the little circles there, but just paint them in like a grid. You could even just do them, like the, the grid is actually is on an angle, right? So you can kind of see it a little bit more when I'm this way. And so I would just sort of, there should be another dot right around here. But then things start getting kind of tight together. Okay. Let's just take a quick little look at these side by side. John says, Michael, your ghost is coming next to my door. Okay, I'm not, what is that I see? Lori says, what do you mean? I don't know. Uh, there's Pascal saying, hello everyone. Nice to see you, Pascal. Lori says, I don't think you can really appreciate art until you've tried making it. That's a great point. I mean, I think there's definitely lots of people that uh, have a love of art that have never painted before. But I do think when you try to, to reproduce some of those paintings on your own, it opens up a whole other way of looking at art. You know, I, I think of it as it's akin to watching a movie with a filmmaker or looking at photographs with a photographer looking at um you know i've seen there's for instance online there's a, a kind of a new trend of like um spies look at the f most famous spy movies and comment on their quality dentists look at famous dentistry you know and so on and so forth and people see things very very differently when they come at it with some experience right and i think painting is no different if you've actually tried to do some of this painting sometimes when you see paintings that do what you've tried to do really really well or when you see when you see paintings that are done really well and you've tried to make that painting before and struggled with it, 
it's sort you're kind of like whoa that is impressive it's like whew. so that's the way i feel when i look at some paintings for sure so let's uh move on here i want to do some blue now this is a cool blue so i'm going to take some cold or sorry some white and cool blue and mix this together bit more blue into it. We'll see how quite dark this is, or light. Again, I have a lot more freedom when there's shapes that are going to be black later on, I can just go like, ah, okay. Well, I, can, I can feel quite comfortable painting over those shapes if I need to, or parts of them. So, you know, part of the, th oops. There we go. Again, I kind of like, whoa, what a big, awful blob shape you just created. That's because I know all of this, I'm gonna shape it with black later on. So I don't, I'm not too worried about making it a perfect shape. Maybe I'll just take a little bit of a, a small brush. Since we're kind of, you know, this painting, because of its flatness, and we've talked about this a few times when we've been looking at cubist paintings, is there's, we don't have the traditional foreground background relationship anymore because everything is sort of flat, right? That's a bit major feature of cubist art is its flatness. Right? We're kind of taking the world like, like a cardboard box with all six sides and opening it up. So, um, in some way, you know, many of the things we've done in the past would have lots of different little layers and building up layers and kind of starting with the background and getting the background finished and then going to the foreground or doing a layer of the background and then going to the foreground and doing a bit there and then coming back, finishing the background completely and then going to the foreground, finishing the background completely and then the painting is done. When it comes to cubist art, that kind of very traditional way of working that artists had used for, you know, a thousand years or more is sort of thrown out the window. And, I, and even though Stuart Davis rejected the idea that he was a cubist, even though he had made a lot of art that had cubist kind of qualities, especially earlier on in his career, 
when he was quite quite clearly you know as a 25 year old man uh, using some cubist kind of uh, style in his work before he kind of settled on the, the kind of the paintings that we're looking at today um, you know this idea of you know basically his paintings don't have any backgrounds or foreground I mean you could say the yellow I suppose is a background um, but I just see it as just another shape here I don't really see it as kind of in really behind everything else so it does make things a little bit more complicated in terms of painting because what's nice about that more traditional approach to painting is we can paint the background and be a little bit sloppy with the background and then paint the foreground be a little sloppy with that then go to the background finish the background and that's when we start to kind of get a little bit more refined and then we move to the foreground and and then finish there and in that in that sort of method at least for the first hour or so while you're getting your underpainting done you can be very loose and free whereas maybe in a painting like this there's not quite as much room for freedom I suppose at least in the the way that you approach the painting initially I think as the painting develops you can there is a kind of freedom in that you can play with where shapes go etc but it is much more rigid which is interesting you know this is not you know again and this is things that I'm just thinking about as I'm making today's painting um, and it's not really something I've thought too much about until today because I haven't really had uh, it's sort of just like what Laurie was saying about like when you start trying to paint another artist's painting it gives you a huge instant awareness as to like the thought process and because one of the things that's, that's very interesting about Stuart Davis is and we see this all the time in any article that's written about him is his interest in jazz music and he cited jazz music as being very very important to him and the kind of paintings he made and jazz music at least at the time kind of early jazz of the 1920s and 30s you know there was a certain amount of improvisation in early jazz but not nearly as much as we might see in like Miles Davis and John Coltrane in the 60s and stuff right that's where you know when people talk about improv and jazz that's really where we start seeing that so I think because I've read a number of, of articles over the past few weeks people talking about Stuart Davis and improv and it's like oh interesting and then you start making a painting like this and you're like really hmm Having said that, like the often when people talk or think about like free jazz and improv jazz, they think of, of musicians as just making things up on the spot right off the top of their head, which is I think a misunderstanding of, of jazz. I'm I'm fortunate enough to have a number of friends who are jazz musicians. And so I've had some of these conversations with them and Uh, while they sometimes do make things up on the spot, most of it is is um, building upon what's already there. It's songs that they've practiced and played hundreds of times, and they play it maybe slightly different, or play it in a different key. 
which might be analogous to how I'm trying to think of how, how people might be able to relate to it in their daily lives kind of like um, let's say like oh, to think about that it's it's maybe like cooking i love making references to cooking uh it might be more like if you've made muffins hundreds of times and then you go to the to the pantry you're about to make some muffins and you've already cracked the eggs and you've got it all kind of it's all started and then you realize like oh I just realized we don't have any um, sugar today like oh, what are we gonna do and ah oh, the someone's you know someone's borrowed the car am I gonna go to the grocery store like, ah and you decide well what if I try using some maple syrup instead like and so I think that's more along when we think of like jazz music it's not like somebody just never like playing something completely different it's like okay we're going to make muffins I've made muffins many times but instead of you know Curious to know if that's working or if people are able to see how this works. I think there wasn't green on the painting before. Cool. Thanks, Pascal, for checking in. Awesome. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I was just like, you know what? Just keep on moving forward. Nothing I can do about it, so. Okay. <laughs> so I see people joining back up. in to say hello again that's awesome so I'm just looking at where I'm at here after a little bit more painting I just kept on going <laughs> um, so I've got now this green in everything looks a little bit strange oh I forgot to get that blue there too everything looks a little bit strange because we don't have the black in when that black eventually comes onto the stage the painting will change dramatically, right? I guess, yeah, well, let's get this blue in here. Thanks, Lil. My wife put in the comments something we will never know about the muffins. Now I forgot what was I talking about with the muffins. Oh, a few different ways of making muffins. We'll never know if the muffins turned out. Well, 
Well, that's frustrating. It's funny, I, uh, it reminds me, I had a teacher when I was in graduate school. Um, his name's Christopher Williams, who's he's a photographer. And he would always say, like, he had these three rules of art. Now I'm trying to remember what they were. <laughs> One of them was um, no, t no electricity. That no, that real art, proper art, should not require, you know, a, a power to, to in order to function. Um, which I've always thought was. I think he was being quite playful. He he's one of these guys. He's he's kind of a very dry sense of humor kind of personalities. But I do think that there was a certain amount of of wisdom in that comment that one of the great things about paintings is that they work whether the lights are on or off, whether the power goes out, right? They're always on. Yeah, you might not be able to see it very well, but it's not like the painting stops working, like when a when you're, if you're trying to watch a movie and the power goes out, well, good luck, right? So I'm just going over top of, of some of these colors. In this case, I'm just starting with the blue just because I, there was an area of blue that I had forgotten to paint, so now I'm just going back to it. No particular rhyme or reason where why I didn't go. If I had done all of the blue, like down here, I wouldn't. I would have just gone right to my reds and pinks, but. some more white. This is my darker blue, so just not quite as much white in it, the second in this one. And there's always sort of like, well, maybe it would have been best to have done like, so for these little dots, if I did them first, then I could paint, clean them up with this blue over top. There's always sort of one color, like in one area, yeah, that color might be perfect there, but in another area, the other opposite color would be best to do the second. You know, you could spend your whole life trying to work out a plan to make it go as perfectly effortlessly as possible from beginning to end and it'll never work <laughs> you know like painting will never uh, it's always going to throw you some curves and frustrate you and that's frustrating but it's also I think that it's it's sort of what makes painting kind of fun sometimes is that that it's kind of like alive and you gotta kind of roll with it you know it's got it starts you know it's it's like we're Dr. Frankenstein here and you're you start creating something and it doesn't always behave the way you want it to behave I'm a 
father of a young child and um, I'd like it if she did exactly what I wanted all the time that would certainly make my life easier but really the for me the great pleasure is when she does things that I don't expect and sometimes even things I don't want her to do that's actually be sometimes those are the things where it's like the most endearing moments of all where I'm like oh you are driving me crazy but it's pretty adorable and a painting is kind of like that sometimes you know you you try to make it do what you want it to do but sometimes it's just not gonna listen uh, Lori says is his painting made in all cool colors uh, the the red is 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 warm red and even the pink is a, is a warm pink so um, and as I said the background I think is it's the backgrounds kind of a a a yellow like it's probably like a Hansa yellow well they wouldn't have had Hansa yellow like a cadmium light or something so it's still kind of like a warm but it's it's a brighter more saturated so it's it's really it's essentially it's kind of in between warm and cool um, so it's just you know, and you can literally get a tube of paint that's like this but um, you would find that you're not going to get quite the, the as bright of oranges or greens if you use just one yellow right because it's going to be right, right in the middle okay so Let's do the pinks next, and then we'll go. Or let's do the r the red. So I'm taking my warm red. And I'll just paint the the red areas, and then I'll go to the pinks afterwards. See, so if I just painted this warm red on top of the yellow, it would not be as kind of nice and saturated as the color that I'm painting with right now. Like, like this is just a, just a gorgeous red now. Like it just it just pops, right? It's kind of like bright red lipstick or something. Like it, you know is you just cannot get that with just one layer of paint even if you're trying to be clever and just paint on a white canvas I think you still need to have two layers of each color just to get them as saturated as he did Sometimes I get sloppy.
it does make me very happy that there's so many people watching uh, today's uh, live stream because Stuart Davis is he's he's one of those artists that is often sort of left out of the grand narrative of, of art um, I think he was absolutely instrumental but uh, these days you know it's it's funny like he was kind of forgotten I mean he was not really embraced by the intelligentsia of the time you know like the critics and the art historians of of during his time were fairly dismissive of him I don't think they liked his his art I think they thought he was just sort of a bit of a a weirdo like his paintings didn't fit in nicely to the to the nice category categories that existed and so they just like ah, it's just easier just to forget about it just pretend he doesn't he's not even there and yet he just kept on going going about it his work and collectors were, were supporting him. He had lots of of um, collectors, famous um, people who were buying his paintings because they really saw, they really liked his work. They, it was clear that he was doing something very different than anyone else. So I just painted over this number six there. It's still there, if you can kind of see. It's just very, it's a little bit darker. Uh, I'm gonna paint that pink again and then paint triangles So again, this is another example of a painting that is going to kind of look a little bit funny Oops, for a while until we um, get the black on there. So you just have to keep on rem reminding yourself that, that, uh, that we're seeing a very, like the undeveloped f version of the painting and that it's going to change significantly um, at, at some point here. Okay, you know, again, it's a little, there's a little areas where I, I might want to go in and add some, touch up the background. Oh, and there's all of those circles. I was just hoping that they would just disappear. <laughs> 
Uh, all of those little circles there. Okay, let's do those darn circles. says in the picture I printed it looks like all the colors are more mid colors not cool or warm never know if it's just my printer um, yeah I, d I don't know what your printer is doing I can say though that I'm pretty confident with the, the choices that I've made here that, uh, that we've got cool blue cool green and then warm red and then a yellow that is sort of halfway between warm and cool which is why I paint, painted the warm red and then put the cool over top of it Pascal says, yeah, printers are a little bit tricky with colors. I mean, you can, so yeah, I would say probably computer, like your personal printer at home, probably be the least reliable thing to judge your colors on, just because they're, they're not really calibrated usually often, unless you're a pro who's calibrating your 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 printer you know I mean that's that's one of the struggles that I mean even books when they're printed sometimes the colors can vary very widely from the actual artwork on display in a museum or art gallery And that's why you should always try to go see art in person if you have the opportunity. If there's ever a, an art exhibition that's up, you know, you might see images on your computer and be like, eh, I'm not really a fan of their work. And then you go see it. Like, I had that in my own experience. I remember, you know, seeing art by, by Jackson Pollock and just being like, ugh. Cannot stand those paintings. They're so ugly and boring, and like. Uh, and I was a student at uh, Cooper Union in New York City, and many years ago. And I remember going and seeing the exhibition because I used to go there to the Museum of Modern Art all the time. Uh, because as a student, I could get in and watch movies. They, they were every night they would have all day long they would have great move they have really one of the best m movie collections in the world no joke i think if they may even have the best film collection in the world and so they'd always be displaying projecting movies that were very rarely seen even to this day a lot of the films that they screen are just not on Line. They're not streaming anywhere. They're not on. Certainly not on Netflix or Prime or what you know, all the different streaming services because they're so obscure. But sometimes are like really important films. And there's definitely times where it's like this is the first time this movie's been screened since it went out of the theaters in 1912 or something. You're like, whoa, that's pretty amazing. Um, so anyway, I would go to the, my student ID got me into the, there's a little bit too much blue on there. 
my student ID got me into the museum. And I'm like, oh, let's go check out the Pollock exhibition. And it blew my mind. And I remember seeing the, the those paintings in person. I was like, oh, no wonder people love these paintings. Because you got to see them to understand them. You got to be, they're giant paintings and you got to be immersed by them. You've got to let them kind of wash over you like a big wave. You know, it's like the same sort of thing like, ah, I've seen waves on television. I, like, what's the point of going to the beach? All right, and you go to the beach and you dip, dip your feet into the water and you feel the water go through your toes and the sand going around your ankles. And you're like, oh, yeah, okay, so this is... A definitely a different experience than sitting on your couch and watching waves on TV, right? Or reading about waves in a newspaper or whatever. Um, so I won't wait. Okay, so now I'm just mixing another pink here. This is just my warm red and white. And maybe is that, did I just, that's a little bit too white. So if you're in that situation, it's a little bit too white. What I'll just take some red and I'll just mix it a little bit off to the side here. Just bring a bit of that white in here. Otherwise, you could spend a lot of time trying to alter the mixture that you already have. I always find it just easier just to make a new mix right by the side. And if you need to, to modify it, you can bring a little bit of that previous color in there. Doing again. the why the show kind of staggered like that why it glitched I think it's it probably has something to do with just the weather we've had here in, in our part of the world recently we've had all this flooding and One of the new words that has sort of come up, I've never heard of it. You, you let me know if you've heard this before, but the word that I hear from people is atmospheric rivers. That there's an atmosphere, a, a chance of an atmospheric river. <laughs> um, of a, like basically a river forming suddenly because of the rain. And that that's, if you haven't, if that's the first time you've heard it, then that's, you're lucky because you haven't had an atmospheric river appearing in your part of the world yet, but apparently it's something that's going to be more and more common as we start feeling the effects of weather more and more.
And I'll just paint that back with some red later on. It's just like any painting, there's always going to be little touch-ups. You're always sort of like, want it, you want to be able to make it and it just to be perfect and that way you can just be at the very end, you touch one area once and then you can just walk away at the very end and, you know, mic drop, it's all done. But the reality is, is that there's always little touch-ups that just... And, and really, honestly, majority of paintings, the last, you know, 5% of the painting often takes longer than the previous 95% of it because it's just all those little touch-ups. And sometimes those little touch-ups don't even happen in the same session. They might be... You, know, you walk away you're like ah, I did it it's awesome I'm so happy and then you come back in the next day with a little bit clearer head and you're like oh ah now I see this thing oh, I gotta fix that you know it's it's kind of typical for for any kind of project that we embark on right there's always a little things that we might not notice until later and right like here I'm putting this red on there I might have to put some blue back in here that's why I kind of I'm not too worried about making everything perfect the first time around because I figure that yeah probably have to be fixing something around we have to mix this color again somewhere, so might as well just not be too, you know, hard on myself. So now I'm just going to mix the the green again. There might be a little bit of it that I can use from before. It's a little bit sticky now. So I'm just going to make a little bit more of it. Let's maybe put just a... Well, we're going to put it... I was thinking maybe I'll put a little bit less white in it just to keep it a little bit more saturated. I tend to kind of like my colors pretty saturated, but we'll see. I think, again, when the when the black goes on here, all bets are off. The painting will change. So, you know, if this is the second time I painted the painting, I, have, I might have a better idea of how things turned out, and I might feel like, oh, okay, actually, you know, it worked out really well when I had that brighter color, maybe without any whiten it at all but since I don't quite know I'm gonna hue a little bit closer to the artists um, uh, original work here Like you could see, I, I take quite a lot of liberty with, if I know an area is going to be black, I'm like, okay, right? Like this area, that's gonna be black in here. So I'm like, well, I'll just paint that in there. And let the black come back over and clean up all of this.
Like, I don't know how well it comes across on camera, but... And I can't remember who was talking about it, but... I think you can see that as I do the second layer of paint, it starts to have a little bit more of that, of the look of Stuart Davis's original painting, right? That kind of surface which appears a little bit thicker and worked. Now that he, he had to kind of massage the surface a little bit if you if you will Okay, maybe a little bit more pink in there too. So I think I'm about maybe 10 minutes away from going to black and today I think I might actually use real black. <gasps> oh no, right? Like I never use black but for a painting like this, I think black is in, in the cards, because um, I'm sure he would have used black. And I think it's going to give a really nice kind of quality to today's painting. You know, and that's another thing that would probably be very you know, along the lines of how he painted, right? There's this classical method of painting that doesn't actually use black or very little of it, mixing it on your own. And for the most part, I kind of follow that convention. But not every artist followed that. And, and today's an example, perfect example of someone who did not obey any of the rules. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sure probably some people even mentioned to him, like, Stuart, you can't use black in your paintings. No one uses black. And he's like, well, I just did, so I don't know what you're talking about. I can do whatever I want. I'm, I'm the artist. I make my paintings. You don't have to like them. But, you know, I, this is how I decide to paint, and, you know, it's... Some people don't like pineapple on pizzas. It's not like you could, there's a way you can prevent people from putting pineapple on pizzas. I used to love Hawaiian pizza, as it is called, or was called, or... I loved pineapple pizzas. <laughs> okay. Oh, I still want to do a little bit of pink down here. I forgot. Okay. This is going to be red in a few moments, but paint that pink. 
I'm a little bummed. I was pretty sloppy with the way I did my little circles there, but even that blue, Michael. to start oh, I want, well maybe I'll blow maybe I'm gonna blow dry everything and paint a little bit of this red right in here I know it's pink but it should go red so let's just mute the audio John says, you know what I clean my own brush one by one. You, you know what I clean my, oh, oh, yeah. You know what I clean my own brush one by one. That's great. That probably means your brushes are gonna last a long time. That's good, that's a good idea. Um, just. Again, all this little touch-ups and cleaning up and... So... Let's, uh... I'm just wondering if I should do any of the white fix touching up the background or I should just let's save that till I got some black in here because who knows I might make a big mis mistake with my black I might as well save all of the fixing to the end right so here's just some black paint You know, I, I don't put a lot, I mean, that's, I was gonna say, that's not a lot, but black, I always find black paint tends to dry pretty quickly. So I always sort of be a little bit cautious about putting too much on your palette, because that way, if it starts, if you're doing a lot of outlining work and you've got black and it's starting to dry out, then it can make your life really frustrating. Uh, if you want, And maybe I'll use a little bit of this. Oops. <laughs> Here's uh, this is fluid acrylic. So fluid acrylic is just a a thinner, more fluid-like acrylic substance. Right. You can hear that it's much more like a fluid. And what I like about that, about fluid acrylics, is they're great for doing outlines because the paint is nice and thin, and yet it's still very opaque. 
and so you you don't have to worry about adding you certainly it's 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 10 million times better than adding water to your acrylic to make it thinner because if you do that you're just gonna have it's the paint is gonna be really thin and transparent you're gonna do at least two more layers to make it look good whereas you can do one layer that looks great with a fluid acrylic a tube like this probably costs like 15 10 15 bucks or so but highly recommended if you're finding your and you can use that for painting any of the things that we're doing I don't know how it behaves when we start adding mediums into it, but I imagine it does a pretty respectable job. So, just to kind of a little bit of a heads up, I maybe maybe I'll use that. Oh, yeah, I'll use it a little bit for some of the 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 details, some of the red or the the black in the in here. Before we get to there, I'm going to start to. Today's painting, by the way, is in the Whitney Museum of Art collection. I think it's probably on display there all the time. There's some, obviously, every museum's got lots of paintings. Not all of them are always on display. This one, I think, is probably on display most of the time. For good reason, it's a popular painting. Um, so as I go across, I'm going to kind of just start working my way from maybe the top down a little bit. It is, does it get, is it a little confusing when I've got, when I've painted over some of my lines? Yes, absolutely, it can be a little bit confusing. What I do though is I just I, I first kind of go and paint the lines that I can see and that helps me kind of get myself into the range. Okay. 
Okay, so like finding this diagonal which has been lost. I just think, okay, if this is a straight line. what I can see. I mean, what a difference. All of a sudden this black just comes in and everything changes. Mm, some things there I can always alter. See, there's sometimes I make little goofs and things in there, and I just keep rolling forward. If I want, I can adjust and fix some of these things later on. If I want to, I mean, again, you just sort of think like, well... Does it really matter that this shape is now slightly smaller than this one? Are people going to be up in arms, angry, picketing my house? No. No one will care, quite frankly. bit of green that I forgot to put in right there. I'll take care of that eventually, maybe. I might forget, but I'll try to remember.
Now there is a lot of texture on here. Sometimes I just sort of wipe it away because I don't like all those little ridges. Or if it's still a little bit wet, you can kind of brush some of it away. Just a personal preference thing. Okay. Well, let's do a ladder here. this up a little bit with a bit of yellow and white You know, there's a reason why comic book artists draw and paint on paper that's twice the size of the actual comic book when it's printed. It's because any sort of little, you know, mistake or whatever sort of just disappears when things are, in, are shrunk down. So you don't have to be so worried about making it perfect because... Literally, those imperfections just seem to evaporate when the when it gets smaller. And I think that's another thing just to think about. Like we're used to seeing, you know, paintings <clears throat> on in books and even on the web. When sometimes these paintings are huge. I mean, we've seen that many times throughout these episodes, where you know. When we actually look at the at how big these paintings are now, this one we'll take a look at the size dimensions here in a, in a few moments. But you know, it's not a huge painting, but it's certainly larger than than this one that, that I'm working on, uh, nine by twelve inches. Which, by you know, most according to kind of like art history this would be a, you know 9 by 12 is a very small painting but are there some paintings this size absolutely there are there famous paintings this size absolutely but um, most of the paintings we've looked at and we've painted over the past of the course of the past year are at least double the size and so they look really great when they're small and reproduced in a book or a magazine. When they get reduced down, um, they look even better, right? So, just I think it's just it's helpful just to keep that in mind. Like so, for instance. The original painting is 52 inches by 42 inches, or 132 centimeters. So that's a meter, over a meter, almost a meter and a, and a, well, a meter and a third. <laughs> um, 52 inches, right? That's that's a big painting. So. You know, 52 inches is maybe like that tall and that wide. So what we're perceiving on the screen is like, especially when we have these two paintings 
side by side and you're like, wow, he was really precise versus, wow, Michael, you're pretty sloppy. You know, these areas in here, it's like, ah. Uh. But again, if we look at them one to one, this detail right here is probably about, I mean, it doesn't even fit on the screen here, right? It's that much bigger, right? Like, you know, that little uh, shape that's inside here is probably about that big around in real life. So just keep that in mind when you're like, oh, how do I get it so perfect? You know, the, my lines are kind of a little wobbly. The painting is much bigger. So don't be so hard on yourself. You know, there's a little gap here where there's some pink underneath this black that I'm just painting. I've kind of just painted it out. It's like, eh. Does that make this painting impossible to understand? Not really. Is it does it like is it is it like as if I've forgotten to paint the Mona Lisa's left eye? No. I don't think so. Maybe there's little areas like maybe I'll touch that up with a little bit of pink later on we'll see ah there's a little bit of a blue gap there do i want to try to get that or just paint let's just paint it black just started now i'm going to have that rolling stone song in my head <laughs> No colors anymore. Want them to turn black. I really like the idea in this painting that um, Stuart Davis is going back to one of his early works and reworking it, reinterpreting it uh, in his more con in the style that he had at the time. Like, I think that's a really interesting thing for artists to do, and this is not the. F you know, there's lots of examples throughout art history of artists doing the same thing. But it's worth just remembering that just because you painted something once doesn't mean you you can never paint it again. Right? That, um, you know, you it's just like if you just because you go on vacation to someplace once it's not like you, you can never visit it again in fact sometimes the pleasure of, of is being able to go back and see things a second time and maybe you're not so rushed about trying to see it all now that you can kind of take your time like one of the things I'm very fortunate to have had the experience of being able to to do a lot of traveling and to go back to the Louvre multiple times and see the same artworks 
Like, I remember the, m the most recent time I was at the Louvre, I went with a really good friend of mine who lives in Paris. And we just... And he's been to the Louvre, obviously, hundreds of times. But we just went in... Maybe an hour before it closed. That's interesting. I'm looking at... Is that pink line? I don't know if that really intersects, just like mine. Mine's a little bit more dramatically uneven, but it's just sort of one of those things like, huh. I mean, do I want to... I could kind of try to f force it. Um, sorry, what was the time of the... <laughs> going to the Louvre and we went there like maybe an hour before it closed and just sort of just went for a nice little casual walk around the museum and chatting with one another and stopping in front of paintings we like and the majority of paintings that we like are certainly not the most famous paintings And that's, you know, if you're fortunate to live in a city with a good museum, you know, it becomes kind of like a living room where you can go in there and hang out. I was a student at the Royal, um, Royal College of Art in London, England. And... I would just, I literally would just go and bring bring a book, a novel. I was reading, it sounds so, all this sounds so pretentious. But, you know, I would, I would go there and I was reading Marcel Proust's uh, Remembrance of Things Past. And just go and I, was, I would go to the Degas room. <laughs> I just, I just as I listen to myself talk, I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, but you know, it was so awesome because you're just sitting there and reading while other people are hurrying through the museum, desperately trying to see everything possible because they're never never know when they'll be back there again. And and I've certainly been like that. I've there's been times where I've been rushing through the world's great art museums, desperate to, to just sort of check something off my list of to be able to say, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I saw the Raphael or the Botticelli, uh, yeah, you know, uh, for 30 seconds. So technically I've seen it in person. Or he says, what would happen if you mixed heavy body paint with fluid paint? Um, I could, I'll do a little bit of that if you like. I mean, it just makes it a little bit more thick. There's, but there's nothing, it, it won't uh, ruin the paint. or um, It certainly works. I've, I've done it before. I mean, it's certain, it's... You know, it's probably not using either paint to its, um, it's, uh, it's sort of like you're, it's, it's, 
It's not using the paint as it's intended to be used. Although again, what does that actually mean? It's just that, um, you know, it's like you have this uh, paint that is very thin, the fluid paint, and so it's great for, and then you're just sort of thickening it up by adding other, by adding a thicker paint into it. So it's sort of like defeating the purpose a little bit, I suppose. You know, I guess you, you could say it's sort of like putting ketchup on a expensive steak, but hey, if if that's how you like your steak and you can afford it, why not, right? <laughs> um, ah. I mean, I'm somebody who, um, who doesn't mind um, doing things wrong. I mean, just whatever, you know, I mean, sometimes you don't have a choice, right? You, Fluid acrylics are, are more expensive, and let's say you want to use mix a, a certain color, and instead of having buying, you know, let's say you only buy a black fluid acrylic and a white fluid acrylic, but you want a pink, so you could mix your red heavy body paint into your fluid acrylic to get that uh, to make a pink. It's just going to be a little bit thicker. Right, but that might be your only solution as opposed to um, yeah so I'm just gonna put well I was going to put a little black square there for some bizarre reason because I was thinking oh I'll be my placeholder but if I'm gonna start writing text I don't want to get to a place and I run out of room here because I've already blocked the shape here. So I'm just going to take a moment to take a little bit of a stock of how things are going here. Let's just see. Now, I, I will say there is maybe a little bit of magenta in in this red. Like, I, I think, you know, he's using, even like with the yellow, which is this yellow is sort of halfway between warm yellow and cool yellow. I think this red does have a tiny bit of coolness in, like as if it's a little, I mean, I could put a tiny bit of that in there just to get a little bit more of a pop that I don't quite have in this color just yet. Because in in his painting, or at least the way it appears on the screen, it's got a, a real hot pink kind of quality. And this, whenever we add white into a color, it takes out some of the saturation, right? So it's we're not gonna get that same popping, uh, saturated pink color. use a little bit of the fluid acrylic maybe to do let's say the remainder of the black do I have a I think I got red too so I'm the one thing and this is just sort of 
true with most as paint gets thinner and thinner it is get a little bit more transparent and reds are tend to be transparent anyway so you can one of the things if you've ever seen these on paints when they have see how there there's these black lines under so those black lines are on the label when they print it and then they just take a little bit of the paint and and smudge it on here and it gives you a little bit of a hint as to how transparent the paint actually is. You can see the magenta is very transparent, right? The, so this is my, the magenta is my cool red and this Napthal red light, this is, this is a warm color, but it's also probably, if anything, it's, it's maybe a little bit more in between my warm red. It's a little bit more of a, you know, I don't know why I didn't get Academy. Maybe I, there just wasn't that color at the supply store when I was there. But and these are probably five years old. So these paints, if you keep the lids on, last fairly long. Okay. What should we do? Let's just go right into this. And so I'm just giving it a good, nice shake too before I start doing anything because. You want, especially as I said, some of these paints haven't been used in a while. Um, so you can see when it comes out of the tube, it's just much thinner. All right, slowly, kind of, you know, if I let it go, it'll it'll slowly drip. So this, I'll, I'll find this is going to make a much easier on me to do a lot of this painting. Uh, now, <laughs> I have lost the shape of what was in here. So, um, I was just going to paint it in. I've, I'm afraid if I start drawing it that I'm going to scrape up some of this paint. So let's uh, I think I'm going to start on the right side here. Ah, I already kind of goofed. Let's just expand that out. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna paint the, the letters in first. Maybe let's just zoom in just a bit more. And then try to go for some of the more stylistic qualities here.
mean, it's funny, like, this reminds me a little bit of graffiti, in that graffiti is often... I've known a few people who do graffiti over the years, and they spend a lot of time trying to, like, almost disguise their word marks and make them kind of obscure. And I've talked about, I'm not the biggest fan of graffiti. I've, if you've been watching me for a while, you know kind of my feelings about it. Um, but, uh... I also, you know, there's art forms that I may not understand fully because maybe I haven't just tried it myself. I, I don't really feel... But, um, I do think, like, there's something about the, these words, how they're all kind of a little bit hard to, to understand and read, that um, kind of prefigures a lot of graffiti. I don't, I don't think that most graffiti artists would have ever even heard of him, so that's, I don't think it's not like, uh, so now as I, I, for some reason, I don't know what, <laughs> definitely does not look like a D. I've definitely made this, talk about making these letters less clear than they used to be. Do I want to fix that, or if, even if I do, that would be tricky. I like how he did it, but maybe I'll, oh, let's see, I'll think about it. Let's just keep on moving forward. Now that is quite the shape there, right? I will say, using these fluid acrylics for this is way easier. It does feel a little bit like cheating if you've, you know, compared to using the heavier body acrylics for doing this kind of thing. Um, Just it goes on so much easier. And what on earth am I looking at here? Wow, okay. See, I'm, what makes me really intrigued is like, how did he, like, what was his thinking with these types of shapes here? How, how did it occur to him to write in this particular way? That's, if I was to, able to ask him a question, that's probably something I would ask, like, so, I mean, I, what I imagine he did is, is sort of wrote it out in cursive onto the canvas. And then as he started painting it, sort of like what I'm doing here, you, you know, sometimes the brush sort of goes, you lose a little bit of control and the line gets a little bit funky. And he just, instead of trying to paint it out to make it more clear, he's just like, ah, I'm gonna run with that. I like that weird new thing that was just created there. Let's just run with that.
So let's start with the O, since that's pretty straightforward and obviously still there. I was going to paint that red again there, wasn't I? So let me just get my warm red. this dry and I'll just move on to a different area I think. I could blow dry it to speed it up but um, maybe I'll just see if I can get the end here. Like I think what's really interesting is, you know, obviously this is not exactly, I'm just eyeballing all of this here. I was going to say, like, you know, the way that he incorporates his signature into these paintings, I think is really interesting. Most of the time, I'm not the biggest fan of including, I used to, there's, there's times where I've included my own signature on the front of my paintings, and there's times where I haven't. There's times where feels really appropriate and other times where it feels like it would be really distracting um, so I always sort of I, I would sort of err on the side of restraint more than uh, when in doubt but he made sort of a deal of like his signature is sort of part of the composition and so it's not just an afterthought, it's not just something that appears there at the very end of the painting. It's like he builds it into the whole overall structure of the, of the artwork. And that I love. I think that's fantastic. Like if you're going to do it, I think thinking about how he does it is... is uh, 
and learning from him, I think is is would be would be very smart. Because most of the time throughout art history, artists, if they include their signature, try to do it in a relatively subtle way. And really, artists only began really signing their work on the front of the painting maybe 150 years ago. Prior to that, you almost never, ever saw an artist signing their work on the front of the canvas. And if they did, it was very disguised. It might be the, the title of a book in the background or something. Okay. Wow, I didn't even realize I'd been painting for this long. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, time is flying. Okay, so let's try to pick up the ante or the pace here a bit and uh, finish off, let's say, some of these letters. I mean, I didn't think today's painting would go fast by any means. I knew that this painting was one of those paintings that just is going to require some time and patience. And that's one of the things I love about painting is is or and art in general is the fact is because it requires time and patience and forces me to slow down and just and be accepting of mistakes and embracing things as they are and this sort of wabi-sabi kind of approach to things I think is it's about as close as I can think of is kind of getting to meditation and I love meditating um, I try to meditate every day I haven't been as good recently about it but um, I started meditating a few years ago. Well, I don't know, five years, four years ago? I'm not sure. And I cannot recommend it enough. It is, it's the best gift you can give yourself by far. And I, you know, I'll, I sometimes do a little quick intro to meditation in my classes at Emily Carr, where I, the university I teach at. And sometimes, you know, I'll, you know, I'll ask people to close their eyes and sit quietly and we'll talk about breathing. And I'll look around and I see like there's definitely some people that are just like, oh my God goodness this guy is so out of touch what a what a moron and you know these are students that are 18 19 20 25 years old and I'm sure if I was that age and I had a teacher that started talking about meditation I'd be like are you serious old man are you kidding me you're a dinosaur <laughs> And then you get a little bit older and you're like, hmm, actually this stuff's pretty cool. It does, does a pretty cool job. So I'm just now using a bit of uh, this fluid acrylic just to kind of go back over. And again, I feel like I'm cheating a little bit. but it is it really helps get a little bit sharper lines because the paint sort of flows into all the little grooves of the painting and just sort of cleans it up so it makes things a little bit easier like when you're painting with the heavier paints and you're trying to do 
delicate details, it can often be kind of frustrating. So maybe watching me do this might encourage a few people to go like, you know what, I'm just going to get a few of those. I'm going to get maybe a black or a white or um, I'll get, you know, the same colors that we use for our heavy body paints, or, you know, the same um, eight tubes of paint. Like, I think the painting probably would have been better, this type of painting, had I done the whole thing in this, with this, um, with uh, fluid acrylics. Okay, I think now what I'm going to do is do a little bit of touching up with white. Um, Lori says, I, this painting is probably understandable to a lot of people just because of the cursive writing. I guess they don't teach it anymore. At first I was appalled, but when I thought about it, so what? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I feel the same way. Cursive writing, I think, was certainly really helpful for, I think, at a certain period and point in time, before everyone had computers, painting in cursive, uh kind of made things easier for for people to read because people's printing can be a little bit uneven at the best of times right i'm trying a little bit of magenta here just while i'm here i'm gonna paint this magenta over top of uh some of my pink areas just as a test I'll let it dry and then I'll think about it. I was just sort of looking at the screen and seeing like my colors seem to be the the pinks are very muted here. Let's see if we just took a bit of white and mixed it into get a bit more of a hot pink. I mean, you could decide for yourself if you want to do this. It feels like a little bit late in the game to all of a sudden be doing this, but... Depending on your the way you think about things, it's maybe better late than never or I do this this pink would look different if I just painted it direct like I think having a bit of the warmer color underneath is helpful. If I just did this magenta on an initially, I think it might be just a little bit too intense. Like it would, it would be the opposite, right? I'd be sitting here going like, whoa, okay, that's too much. How do I tone it down? And I'd probably be at this stage of the painting adding warm red back over top of it. Maybe I won't do it to every part of the painting. Maybe it's kind of nice to have 
some degrees of different kinds of pinks and everything here. So maybe let's do a little bit more right here. Yeah, I kind of like that. And I also like that now there's a few different ones kinds of going. So let's keep that like that. And because I made those little changes, maybe there's little touch-ups that I'm just gonna take care of here and there. Okay. Now let's do any touch up with some white now. Some little things here and there. So I love doing this kind of thing, just cleaning a painting up. This kind of paint, this particular kind of painting is the kind of painting that almost requires it. I find it super satisfying. I could she's I know some people dislike doing this kind of thing. They find it like really busy work and they'd rather just kind of get it done very easily, very quickly. And there's lots of paintings that we've done that have very, very loose style. Like we've seen particularly many of the Chinese painters we've looked at, because it's sort of like a feature of Chinese art, of having... Um, Of like a really it's not that the paintings are simple or they're careless as artists if anything they might have practiced dozens and hundreds of times on other pieces of paper and then executed it the way they want to and that's the painting we see and maybe they threw all the other ones out right um, and just to give us the illusion that it was done almost like masterfully, right? There's a long history of artists doing that, right? Um, so that we, the painting we see, we're like, wow, it was just done like so quickly. 
Yeah, but you're seeing the one... You're seeing the painting that, that worked. There might be other ones that uh, ended up in the artist's garbage can that looked a little bit more worked. And the artist threw those ones away because they wanted to create... They wanted one that looked very effortless. You know, Henri Matisse, the 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 French painter um, who did the cutouts. That I think Pas was it Pascal or Josh was mentioned right off the top. You know, he's famous for doing that. He's famous for making paintings that look really effortless. But he would work on them and obsess on them, and he would use various different techniques to disguise all of the effort he, he put into the painting so that it would it would have that effortless kind of quality I mean we you hear that sort of refrain ah oh, my kid could do that he wanted people to look at his paintings and go ah my kid could do that because then people would feel like wow it's just sort of, sort of so effortless and so easy And he wanted, he, Matisse famously said that he wanted painting to be like a comfy chair. And that people have been arguing over what he actually meant for, since pretty much the day he said that, he actually wrote it in a, in a, a kind of an essay um, a long time ago. Um... I remember I had a teacher in college who said something to me once when I was in graduate school. It's like you, uh, the way you talk about art reminds me a lot about a lot of Matisse. And I was like, really? Wow. He's like, and you should. There's a book of his that you should read. So I went out and read it, and I was like, wow, this is. I do really feel like I under I feel like it makes a lot of sense. This is a lot like how I think about painting. And then I had a meeting with him again, and he and he was like, and I said like, yeah, I really. Thanks for for showing that to me. I really. Um, it was great to kind of, you know, to. To find someone who kind of, th thinks and writes a lot like how I think about painting, and he's and. He was like, well, the thing is, is that. Matisse didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> he like he was. Um, his art, he was, he was not. Uh, he. He was basically suggesting that like Matisse said one thing and did the other kind of thing. Anyway, this this teacher and I did not. <laughs> get along very well. He was constantly driving me crazy and I got stories about that guy. Ugh. But, you know. So here I'm just backing out. Sometimes you got those teachers in your life that help you and sometimes you got some that frustrate you and sometimes they're the same person. This guy was yeah, not, not, uh, I don't really have fond memories of him as a teacher, but. So there's a lot of these little touch-ups. Remember I was saying that, like, why bother fixing everything right now when I might have to go back and fix a bunch of things later? So that's where I'm at, right? Fixing all those things later. Now, I will say that I have made things a little bit more difficult for myself because of the fact that I used the... Yeah, this is going to be interesting to see how this works. Because I used the warm yellow and then painted the cool yellow over top. So, we will see here... <clears throat> 
very shortly how well that turns out because I am anxious about putting that cool, that warm yellow back over top of the cool yellow. So this might be the beginning of a number of 20 minutes of, of, of uh, angry <laughs> swearing. <laughs> and uh, so if you have small children or people who are sensitive, uh, you may want to ask them to leave the room right now <laughs> because it is entirely possible that things could get um, <laughs> could, could, could get very dark very quickly. Uh, I'm just kidding, of course, right? Again, it's just a painting, right? And I know it sounds ridiculous. You know, I've devoted my life to painting, but... You know, it's, it's like hockey players saying, like, you know, it's just a game. You know, you do your best, you don't always win, right? It's not worth um, tearing your hair out. You just do your best, and if it turns out great, if it doesn't, that's too bad. There's, there's always tomorrow. see a few more little messes in here. Some of that's from the original tracing process. Okay, so I'm gonna blow dry this. One thing I notice is that the fluid acrylic areas are still wet, right? Which is not surprising to me. Fluid acrylics are gonna take longer to dry than, than the heavy body or even soft body acrylics. So you just have to let it dry or use a blow dryer to help speed up that process. Again, none of this is surprising to me. Ah, you know, okay, so what I thought, th this fluid acrylic is also glossy. I always forget. Um, yeah, see, this is... I'll have to look and see if there's another black that is... See, here's gloss all the way up to the top. I want it to be matte. So I'll have to look at the art supply store next time because I generally, as you may have heard me say in the past, I'm not a big fan of glossy paints. And I'm, that's, I'm definitely in the minority there. The vast majority of people prefer their paint nice and glossy. Okay, so I'm taking... This is... 
my warm yellow from the very beginning of the painting that we used. Remember I painted that to start, so there's still, uh, it's still liquid and wet, so I'm gonna use that. So now I'm just, I want to try to avoid any texture or heavy buildup. So it's going on pretty well. We'll see as it dries what the overall effect is. Once I put on the cool yellow, I'm hoping that it will get rid of um, any strange kind of lines that might have formed. We'll see though. I also, you know, again, does it does the surface need to be perfect is another question one could always ask themselves. I think Stuart Davis would probably say no. As much as I think he likes having a level of sharpness and cleanliness to some of these paintings, there's seeming sort of embrace of, of some level of... of uh, of um would you say like imperfection which we can see like mostly in the way that he does the letters says Michael maybe use violet for the black interesting I'm not not sure I understand what you mean there Paul why would you want to use violet for the black interesting I mean, if you mixed your own, um, your own uh, black from the colors that we have on the palette, you it would be maybe potentially a little bit violet for sure. So I, I could see some people saying, well, I'd much rather just get these little 
circles right the first time the noodling around here. Like I'm doing. I could, you know, sure, it's always easier to do it right the first time. But I also always sort of take in, like, well, how, when you say right the first time, what does that actually mean? Because one person's right is another person's, like, obsessive compulsive, <laughs> you know, where you're just, it's like, you know what, like, I'm fine with a level of imperfection that maybe some other people aren't. And I think about that like when, you know, people are, are taking photographs of their art and uploading it to the Facebook group. And some people are like, ah, you know, there's still a lot I want to do on there. It's still like looks very sloppy. And yet none of us can actually see those problems on screen, right? Like the, they sort of just disappear because um, those little details are uh, just not visible. It's the painting, they're, they're either too small or they're really not important. Imper yeah, so. So there's a little bit of a patchy quality. I don't think it's showing up on camera. I'm, I'm much happier now. Everything's sort of getting a little bit more refined. I'm gonna blow dry it and then I'm gonna put some cool yellow back over top of everything. Okay, there's a few things I noticed before I get to the yellow. I always I keep forgetting to do this green back here. Wonder where uh, Lolly is tonight. She's always telling, reminding me of the those things that I forget to do.
Okay. <laughs> good to see you in the chat, Lolly. I appreciate it. That's good. That's very, very funny. Uh, um, okay. <laughs> oh, wow. So, I think I'm, I'm just going to, uh, can I get away with any of this? Yellow, I just want to make sure I don't get any green or anything on there, and then that would just, that would be icing on the cake, wouldn't it, right? So here's my cool yellow. Remember I, I added this earlier on the painting. I'm pretty confident that it should, especially if I paint at a relatively, not, not that I'm going to gob it on here, but if I'm fairly liberal with my application, it should cover up and integrate any of my so-called mistakes. It's looking good up there so far. You know, where it gets a little bit more frustrating is going to be maybe in between all those little dots. And it can be done, it's just patience, right? How much patience do you have and how much time do you have to endlessly tweak things and fix things and I, mean, I don't think anything that I'm doing right now or for the past like half hour has probably been visible on screen all of this kind of touching up in the yellow um, but it so far looks like it's paying dividends like now I can still see like a little I mean because yikes <laughs> cool yellow is is a pretty is very transparent it, I would say, in terms of the most transparent colors on the palette, probably your cool yellow, and then cool, uh, cool red, and then maybe the warm blue. I think those would be the most transparent colors on this particular palette, regardless of the brand that you use. Magenta is a very transparent color. So let's just go down to a smaller brush.
Now, personally, now when it gets to this level where most of that, the patchy qualities have sort of disappeared, some of that stuff, not only do I not mind, I actually like. Right? So there's a there's a point where some sometimes seeing some of the that work is desirable. You know, if we think about the Jean-Michel Basquiat painting, the two paintings, well, the one that we did that is based on a piece of, that was, the original is painted on a piece of paper, and at the end, I was going and sort of dirtying the canvas to give it a, a little bit more of the look of that dirty paper. Um, I think it, it added a huge, it really improved the painting, because otherwise it looked kind of a little bit thin and um, just very kind of flat. Adding the 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 those little bits of slightly darker colors, like as if it was a little bit dirty, I think dramatically improved the painting. It's not dry. And sometimes I think that can be the problem with some paintings, or at least in my view, is sometimes people's paintings just look so clean and perfect that they kind of look like they were just printed out of off of a computer. And some people really like that. And they want that super slick kind of quality. Nothing wrong with that. But sometimes it, then it's like, well, then why even paint it? If, if you want it to look like that's sort of my argument against like photorealism it's sort of like great it looks like it, it's a photograph okay well then why bother painting it like personally I when I'm looking at other people's art what gets me most excited is seeing their individuality, their 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 unique form of expression coming through. And but you know, to each his own. If if some people paint that way and it makes them excited and they feel like a sense of super satisfaction for having created something that looks like a photograph, then that's awesome. That makes me really happy. If that brings somebody happiness, then that's then that should be all that's required, right? All right, it's like Cheryl Crow says, if it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. Uh, oh yeah, there's a little bit. Oh, so it's just the signature. I think that's the only thing. I might do, I hope you don't mind, but I think I might just use the... Uh, now this one... Huh. Let's see if there's anything... Again, it's been years since I opened this one up. fluid this fluid acrylic is anymore oh there's a little bit hmm I'd have to do some research to find out how to rescue that's definitely not fluid acrylic anymore it's 
dried up quite substantially. That's a bummer. Um, I don't know what the best way to rescue that is. I'd have to, do, again, do a little bit of research. I'm sure, you know, the first instinct is like, oh, just put a little bit of water in there. But I would lean more to something else, like, um, um, like maybe the self-leveling gel, I don't know, um, So let's see. Now, see, this is what it should sound like. Lolly says that you could. I could use my pins. Yes, my wife is borrowing the red. <laughs> I haven't seen it in a while. I think it's still somewhere in the house. Um. I wonder what this... Let's try a bit of this magenta. And since the question was asked what happens when we mix our... our um, let's, let's just do that. So the people were asking. What happens if I mix heavy body with fluid acrylics? Well, we'll see here. Because I'm going to add a little bit of... Because as I said... This fluid acrylic is very transparent. You can see how like it it almost doesn't cover that black at all, right? And if I paint that onto here, I'm expecting it to be very transparent. So let's add a bit of of white into this color to make it a little bit more opaque. Now, again, we're we're th substantially thickening up this fluid acrylic um, so it's it's okay it's now becoming more like a heavy body paint but let's see how much we can get out of it and it's again it's just a painting right let's zoom in And as I said, you don't have to include his signature in here, and, but I do think that he saw this as an important part of his paintings, is including the signature. I kind of goofed there a bit, but that's okay. I have to say, you know, it's coming, it's still working pretty well, the, the uh, 
fluid acrylic with the, this bit of white in here, the heavy body paint. Even then, it's still very dark. Like, if I had just painted this without any of that white in, it would be substantially darker. Um, especially on top of this yellow here. Okay, so last little touches. Just going to go around the picture, see if there's anything that needs to be touched up on I mean some of that circle stuff will always drive me nuts but Take a bit of this yellow. I'm going to take a bit of white again to give it a bit more of an, a slightly more opaque quality. Here I am and you can't see anything I'm doing. How many times does that happen every episode? That should be part of the official drinking game where you can't see anything of what I'm doing because I'm all zoomed in on a different part of the painting. Whoa, okay, I gotta finish up here. I'm just looking, I saw the time. Where does the time go? My goodness. I'm just gonna blow dry this real quick. Last little touch ups with this cool yellow. I'm a little worried that it, um, some, those areas are still going to actually going to be a little bit brighter because there's no warm yellow underneath there, it's just the, the white. But again, it could be just like a kind of a nice little contrast to the some of the areas that are a little bit darker in this yellow. So we might have a few little areas that have got a bit more, a bit lighter, some that are a little bit darker. Oh, 
Always looking for a bit of that balance. Okay. Good enough for government work, I think. Yeah, I see Emerson says, this is so cool, it's pop art in a way in the 50s before the big Warhol fame afterwards. Absolutely, yes, Stuart Davis is is often seen as a quote-unquote proto-pop artist. As an, as, And I really think without Stuart Davis, we wouldn't have Andy Warhol, we wouldn't have Roy Lichtenstein, we wouldn't have a lot of, of the art that we know today. He was... He made paintings like this, you know, really starting in the mid 1920s, which was very radical, right? Like, no one was making paintings like this at all. We talked about Fernand Leger, um, the synthetic cubist painter, um, and even though Stuart Davis toyed with cubism for about 10 years, this was really unlike anything anyone was making. At the time, certainly in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, no one was doing anything like this, as far as I'm aware. Maybe there's, I'm sure there was probably someone somewhere in Brooklyn that we've never heard of <laughs> that uh, made a few paintings like this, but in terms of that is known worldwide, was, he was in a world of his own. Uh, which I think he liked perfectly fine. I don't think he felt lonely or... He, again, he sold a lot of his work. It was just the critical recognition which eluded him for most of his career. Uh, but, you know, there was just a big exhibition at the Whitney Museum a few years ago. Uh, and there's... He never had a problem selling his work. It was just the critical recognition that kind of eluded him. But that's sort of come over... I mean, sadly, after he died, he received a lot more of it than while he was alive. But again... There's lots of artists. We've we've looked at a number of artists. Robert Bateman probably being the most famous artist, certainly the most successful successful artist from a popular standpoint and commercial standpoint. Robert Bateman easily is the most successful Canadian artist in in history. But the National Gallery doesn't own any of his work. None of the major art museums in Canada own any of his work. I mean, the critics dismiss him as a hack. I don't know. I uh, I find that I think in a hundred years, it's going to be one of those things where be like, how is that possible that no one... Why was why did people have such a closed-minded idea of what art was back then? He made it with a paintbrush, just like everybody else did. Just because they're paintings of animals and stuff, people don't... Like, anyway, I... Don't get me started <laughs> about the art world and how decisions are made. That's a, a conversation for, for another time. Um, anyway, let's sign this and sign off. If you enjoyed today's episode, I know there's lots of new people who've been popping in and out of the chat. Consider subscribing, liking the episode. If you want to find out when new videos are coming up, sometimes I do these quite spontaneously and uh, hitting that notification bell is handy because that way you don't miss out when I suddenly go live you can just be watching cat videos on YouTube and be like hey look Michael's live again let's let's tune in and see what that weirdo is up to Again, I, the title of all of his works, we talked about this earlier, but... Ow! In... Sen... 
Pow! Like, I, I, I have no idea what <laughs> that title has to do with this picture in any way whatsoever. Remember, this is based on one of his earlier works of a coffee percolator. So what is Ow and San... Pa maybe, maybe he spilt uh, hot coffee on himself when he was in San Pao. And that's when he and he didn't title the original one that, but in retrospect, he was like, "Oh, this painting reminds me of that time I burnt my hand while I was making coffee one morning." <laughs> Artists can be kind of weird people, right? So, uh, thank you everyone for painting along with me. If you want to support the channel, there's the PayPal link in the description below. You can send a check or e-transfer or an elephant through the mail. If you want, just contact me first so that I can build a place for your elephant. We will see you guys on Thursday. We're going to be painting Pier Mondrian, one of the most famous artists of all time. Uh, similar in some ways to what we've been doing today. Uh, I'm going to do two paintings by him because one of them is very straightforward and another one's much more complicated. So we'll <laughs> I'm always trying to balance that out. And and then on Saturday, I have to remember what the schedule is. Saturday, we're going to this is going to be a special bonus episode, Jay DeFeo's The Rose, and that one's tons of texture. And I'm even. Contempl there's a few ideas I have for that, so I might go get some... Uh, well, there's a few different things I have ideas, but we'll talk about that maybe on Thursday. And then on Tuesday, we're going to be painting a Christmas tree. Um, so, it's lots of stuff coming down the pipelines, including the intro to painting classes in January. Thank you, everyone, for joining me painting along once more. And... Uh, my brain is is empty. I don't know what else to say, so that's a good idea to say goodnight. <laughs> Take care, everyone. We'll see you guys in a couple of days.